Well, hello, Michael. It's good to have you back. Hey, well, how's it going? Uh, not too bad. Um, do you have a joke for us today? We missed it last time. I do have a joke. Uh, it's a joke that relates to wheat. Are you ready for it? I'm so ready. Okay. What did the wheat farmer with a headache say when all of his crops disappeared? I have no idea. Ah, my grains. <laughs> Like a migraine and head. Oh, migraines. Oh, I get it. That was actually pretty good. Oh. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. So <laughs> amazing. Welcome to Field Notes. My name is Will Fullwider, and I'm joined by my co host, Michael Geisinger. We are two regional crops educators with UW Madison Extension in Wisconsin combining our skills, knowledge, and experience to help farmers and agronomists develop research-based solutions to issues facing agriculture in Wisconsin. All right, well, we're glad to have Michael back on to tell his fantastic jokes that I don't get initially. But today we're not talking about Michael's jokes. We're talking about one of my favorite practices, uh, frost seeding red clover into standing winter cereals. We've got Scott Schultz on the program today. Scott is a beef cow farmer in Jefferson County, is a member of the Jefferson County Soil Builders Producer-Led Watershed Group. Scott, thanks for coming on today. Uh, can you take a minute to introduce yourself in your farm? Sure. Uh, hello, my name is Scott Schultz, and like you said, I do farm in Jefferson and actually in Dodge County. I have a cow-calf operation. I started out as a dairy farmer, so I have a background in dairy, beef, and more recently, poultry. So that's where I'm at. I grow corn, wheat, soybeans, a little bit of rye, oats, and alfalfa, and grasses. Nice, quite a bit of diversity on that farm. Uh, how many acres are you farming? I I own uh, 85 acres with my family, with my wife and children, and we rent um, 160 acres that's in Dodge County. Gotcha, gotcha. And so we're talking about frost seeding red clover today. We've talked in the past uh, about it with you a little bit, and you've been doing it for ten years. You know, you've tried you've tried everything under the sun with uh, with how to do it. But I want to I want to get into the like the original idea is what was your original intent when you started frost seeding red clover? So I came across this kind of as a fluke. I was uh, I was doing some custom harvesting for a neighbor. And he called me up and said he had some clover for me to bale. And um, this was a person that was a cash cropper and I didn't think had any any legumes. And uh, I went over there and saw this beautiful crop of clover that he then explained to me that he had frost seeded in with his fertilizer in the spring. And I saw the potential of how much feed I could make off of this. And that is how I got started. Great. And to backtrack a little bit, um, then frost seeding of red clover is you're throwing the seed out there, broadcasting kind of during this uh, March time, more or less, when the ground is freezing and thawing. And that freezing and thawing action brings the small seeded clover seeds into the ground. And you, that's you're frost seeding it into a standing wheat field. So this wheat already planted that past fall and then the wheat is starting to grow and the clover's growing kind of underneath it. Is that how, is that how you went about it, uh, Scott? Yes. Uh, actually the first two years I had the co-op spread it. They used an airflow machine to put my urea on and they added the clover seed to that. Um, we proceeded to do that for two years but then I started doing some research and realized that to get the clover out there early enough, I was actually putting the urea down too soon. So I bought a three-point spreader for my small tractor and started planting that way. Um, the drawback with that was uh, as, as you frost seed, you really want to be out there just as the frost is coming out and eventually you start leaving wheel tracks. So 
so the most recent way I I proceed is with a speeder on the back of my UTV, which is a much lighter machine, and uh, it goes much faster, and it's been working real well. That's great. And then, Scott, are you primarily bailing this red clover and using it as feed that way, or...? Okay, so that's how I originally started with it. I um, I was bailing a crop off of it in the fall and then coming back and actually taking a crop off in the spring before I planted corn. But after all the meetings we've been to and all the different things we've tried, I have realized I, I do want to leave some out there for building up the soil and increasing my nitrogen. So if I do take any off in the fall, I will not take it off again in the spring. I usually get a pretty good regrowth. So I went from completely doing it just for feed to depending on my soil conditions, um, you know, the fields that need more nitrogen, I will leave it. And the ones that, that are, that I can basically haul manure on later, I will, I will harvest. Cool. And you had mentioned a little bit about what you do for kind of your seeding method with the UTV. I was curious too, are there any particular things you're looking for from a timing standpoint? I know we talk about March, uh, but are you kind of watching when that, when the snow layer is kind of off? Uh, I know that when we frost seed, we're kind of looking for those cracks in the soil that the seed can fall into. Is there anything like that that you're watching out for to know when the timing is going to be just about right to get out there and do this? So when I get to end of March, early April, I, I'm watching the weather as far as when do I have a morning when it, the ground is froze that I'm not going to leave any imprints with the machine and I can see that it's going to be starting to warm up because you, the idea is is to try and get it out there last frost. Well, every time I do that, I get more. It freezes more times after that. It's it's uh, it's almost impossible to predict if we're going to have another frost or not. But so that's what I I usually aim for the last week in March. Gotcha. And you'd mentioned um, earlier about taking it for feed sometimes in you uh in the fall and if it's you're trying to rehabilitate the soil or add some or it's a poor soil what have you you'll leave it in the spring for the following corn crop do you see um a difference if you leave it in the fall and in the spring as like that gives you the most nitrogen for your following corn crop or um does it not really matter if you take it in the fall well like i said i've done both and um I really haven't seen that much of an increase by leaving the fall crop. And the more um, research that we've been doing, I'm talking to different people. And by leaving it in the fall, you have more of a chance of it going down in the spring. And then it, it causes that heavy slimy layer because I plant green. So I need I need everything standing as much as possible when I'm planting into it, and and if the clover gets too tall and too heavy, it uh, it does it makes like a mat on the on the ground, so I'm kind of trying to avoid that. Gotcha. So almost taking a fall cutting, which then you feed to your to your animals, is is beneficial um, for m preventing it from kind of suffocating itself more or less um and giving you a better uh seed bed in which to plant into because it's standing absolutely and so when you are thinking about management of nitrogen during the corn season you're realizing okay i have this beautiful crop of red clover that you're planting green into are you adjusting your nitrogen as a result have you cut back on your kind of uh, on your nitrogen applications to that corn crop? Um, absolutely. I last three years, I have cut back the nitrogen on the fields with clover by 40 to even 60 units. 
And um, the things I'm trying now, uh, last year I had some clover that didn't come in as well. Into One thing you're going to find with, with doing this, if you have a really good wheat crop, the clover doesn't do as well. So last year I mm. had a really good wheat crop and the clover wasn't, it, it didn't look as good. So what I actually did was I went in with peas and oats and a little bit of vetch. And I put that in after the wheat came off and it made a beautiful crop. And um, I actually just walked the fields about three weeks ago where I had done that and the clover is actually coming in now that it's been laying dormant for, you know, over the summer that the clover is filling in. Oh, interesting. So it's adding these extra crops in the mix so much gave the clover time to recover a little bit and come back in the spring. That's, that's what I'm hoping for. Yes. I'll know more in a couple, in about a month or so. Right. Right. And so you're you're taking away 40 to 60 uh, pounds of nitrogen. Are you seeing similar yields to what you would have um, if you had put on those units? Or are you taking a little bit of a yield hit when you when you cut back? I haven't noticed any yield uh, yield hit yet. Um, what I did find is I had a field last year that the clover didn't come very well, and well, actually, it didn't come at all. Um, and I didn't do anything different on that field. And there I took a real yield hit. I mean, you could definitely see it needed more nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And speaking of yields, does this practice at all affect your wheat uh, yield or harvestability in that, or in that same vein? No, I haven't really noticed too much. Um, I've talked to a couple of different people that, that say they can still yield 100 bushel of the acre with the clover in there. I don't, I don't push real hard on that. Um, I'm using my wheat more for a year to basically get my cover crops in and prep the ground for the following year. I mean, not that I'm not, uh, I think last year my wheat averaged 85 bushel the acre. So that's, that's nothing to complain about in my book. Um, so I, I don't really see it. Yeah. Uh, so I know you're harvesting that wheat then for grain. I'm curious too, have you harvested the straw off of that or has that become difficult with the clover kind of coming up through or is that just not fit into your system? Okay. So there's a whole other scenario because <laughs> I have tried different things. So the person that I, I custom harvested for that first year uh, they tried to take that straw right down to the ground and they ran all that clover through their combine and that custom harvester said, if you ever do this again, I am not coming back. So the practice that I follow is I normally just take the heads and I spread the straw out and then I come back when the weather's, you know, like instead of worrying about trying to get the straw off immediately after you combine, I've got a bigger window now because I've got the straw spread out. I can wait for a couple of nice days. I come back through with my disc vine and, and recut the whole field. And in that situation, I do lose a little bit of straw because you're grinding it up so much, but you know what? <laughs> the ground needs organic matter too. So I'm not too worried about that. But what yeah. that also does is it mixes the clover and the straw together. And when I use the straw for bedding for my beef cattle, they love it. They actually will graze the straw before they lay on it. They they go through and they pick out all the clover, and it uh, it works really well. That's awesome. Uh, when you kind of get that mat of straw and even just the practice of the red clover in general, I'm curious too, you know, are there any weed control benefits that you have kind of with this practice or... Maybe you have some weed control issues. Uh, I'm just curious, maybe if you could speak into your experience with with weeds and all of this and what that's been like too. Okay, so I I generally plant eight to 10 pounds of clover. I'm going to go back to 10. I, I cut back to seven to eight last year. And I think that's why that hurt me a little bit on that one field. And if if it comes up, oh, I would say 
nine out of the 10 years, I've had a beautiful mat of clover after I take the, the weed off. I don't use any weed control after the, after I take the straw off. If uh, generally I just let it go and I take another crop of clover or now with this new practice of adding more um, cover crops into there like peas or oats and rape and vetch. Yeah, I don't use any any herbicide after after the wheat comes off. So speaking of using herbicides, are you, I mean, obviously planting a legume, a broadleaf legume into a grass like wheat really restricts your abilities to use in-season herbicides for wheat. And so I'm, I'm wondering, do you have any other in-season weed control than just the red clover growing underneath? And have you had problems with that in the past? Yeah, it, in all the years that I've done this, I have never sprayed my wheat fields. Um, there's, I've had some some marginal ground in the past where there was some wetter spots in the field where I would get some some giant rag growing, but in the last two to three years, I weeds have not been a problem. So talking about herbicides. Um, you know, I want to roll into termination. You mentioned planting green. So how are you terminating that red clover? Is it just a burn down or, you know, how does that work for you? So because I'm planting green, I, I actually go in and plant and I will come back through with uh, glyphosate and then my residual within a couple of days of after I plant and I've never had a problem with glyphosate killing the clover. I know people have said, oh, you can't kill clover with glyphosate. Well, I've actually tried to keep it alive in between the rows by fan spraying with my corn planter because I was going to see if it was possible for the corn to pull the nitrogen out of the growing clover. And, um, and just the overspray is, is too much that it, uh, it takes it out. And I was also informed that it's a bad idea because you don't get the nitrogen out of the clover until it actually dies. Yeah. And that's kind of, that's, it'd be great to be able to have that cover underneath the, uh, underneath the corn to help also with the, um, with weed control as the corn is emerging. But like you're saying, you really don't get that, the nitrogen released back into the soil available to the corn crop until that, um, that clover is indeed terminated. I know we're talking about the benefits for like the following corn crop after this red clover. I'm curious, Scott, if you would maybe speak into a little bit. I, I know it sounds like the red clover does really well, but maybe from just a yield standpoint, what that's looked like if you're seeding like after harvest for wheat compared to inner seeding, uh, if you've ever compared between those two on your farm. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, I'm glad you asked me that because I still feel that you get a a lot better you have a lot better chance of getting a good stand of clover when you plant it in early spring versus if you plant it in august because clover is just one of those crops that you know it can get awful dry in august and it might get off to a rough start where if i'm putting it down in the spring when all the spring rains are coming it usually it sprouts and it gets going and Come August, you've already you've already got a good start there, and it it recovers really fast after that first cutting. And that way, you're also lessening the amount of stuff that you have to do after your wheat harvest. You know, especially if you're trying to dry out the straw and everything, rather than having to harvest the wheat, come back harvest the straw and then plant. You know, you're planting in March. When what else are you doing in March, <laughs> other than sitting sitting on your yeah. sofa watching television or whatever as the ground's starting to thaw? So you know, I feel like it also helps to spread out that labor across the year. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, are you only uh, cutting it uh, and feeding it and uh, or are you grazing it off as well? And then how does this how does feeding it or grazing it play into kind of your larger uh, nutrition for your uh, your beef uh, cow calf pairs? So I also have tried grazing. I, I will do that any place that I'm able to get the cattle to. Uh, the first year I was very nervous about um, putting the cows out on a field of clover but i've found that 
because you have volunteer wheat and nobody does a, a, a perfect job. And because I spread it out with the combine, you're not just putting the straw in a row, you're actually spreading out the, the, the wheat seed that comes through the combine. So that adds that adds some some different variety. You know, you have a grass in there with with your legume. And I have not had a bloat problem, but I do load the cows up pretty heavy on dry hay before I'll put them out there. And I also think that when they're eating, they're actually picking up some of that that straw residue that's left from from when we bailed the straw. And so that works out really well. I mean, they they really they love that crop. And the to answer your other question about the protein value, I think I've only had the clover tested once. Um, generally, I do make it as high moisture round bales and wrap it in plastic. And the one year that I had it tested, I think it was like 90% protein. Gotcha. So I actually do have to tone it down a little bit. I'll feed grass with it because mm -hmm. it's actually a little on the rich side. A little bit too hot. <laughs> yeah. And so when you're out grazing uh, those cows, how how long do you have pretty much? I imagine that you're grazing them in the fall mostly rather than the spring. How long can they get right. be out there for? How many months or weeks do you have of grazing? Well, I tend to overgraze. I'm going to be the first person to uh, admit <laughs> that. <laughs> I'm actually looking at uh, starting some rotational grazing in the next year or so. But they're usually on it for a couple of weeks. And and they'll just keep eating. I mean, they they seem to keep finding more and more out there. But now that I'm adding more different covers after the wheat comes off, um, there's different there's different crops out there that that'll last a little bit longer. So they get more of a variety now. You had mentioned earlier about planting other covers into your red clover fields. Is this something that you're going to continue to do? Uh, and what do you see as the benefit of it? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, last year, I tried three different three different things. I put a ten way mix on one field that was designed for grazing, and that had more grasses and you know more things that they were able to eat in the fall, and then there was only a few things that are going to overwinter. So by putting the clover down first, I pretty much have my overwinter covered. So I'm more looking at things that will die out in the fall. So I'm looking at the peas, the oats, and well, the vets should overwinter, hopefully. And that's going to be kind of my go-to from now on. And I'm going to throw some rape in there too, just for the root system. But uh, that's, with all the different things I've tried, that seems to be where I want to be. And after that, you've still got a good stand of healthy red clover coming into the spring because it's the only thing that'll overwinter. And even though that you're planting into it with a bunch of stuff, it's still able to hang out and hold its own. That's correct. Yep. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, Scott, I think we might be nearing the end here. So I did want to at least you give, give you the opportunity uh, to answer one last question here. So let's say there's a farmer out there listening to this and is thinking about practicing this. Uh, what advice would you give them uh, if they were interested in starting to try this on their farm? So I guess um, start out small. I mean, just try it on try it on one field. See how it works. I, they should be able to find somebody that can, that can help them with that if they don't have a, a cedar. Um, it's a very inexpensive way to get started, and um, I guess, in my opinion, what would you rather do? Would you rather take a wheat crop off in August and have to hire somebody to come and spray it and kill it and and not gain anything, or would you rather take your wheat off, have a beautiful, lush green crop out there, and not have to deal with any chemicals and and do some good for the ground. Sounds pretty great to me. Sign me up. 
I'm ordering my red clover right now. So. <laughs> You've convinced us both, even though we don't farm. <laughs> well, Scott, thank you so much for taking some time to chat with us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. This has been Field Notes from UW-Madison Extension. My name is Will Fulwider, Regional Crops Educator for Dane and Dodge Counties, and I was joined by my co-host, Michael Geisinger, Crops Educator for St. Croix, Barron, Polk, and Pierce Counties. A big thank you to Joe Ryan for creating our theme music and to Abby Wilkimaki for a logo. If you have any questions about anything you've heard today or about your farming practices in general, reach out to the Extension Agriculture Educators serving your region.